watch that too? What was it? Um, so like the... Oh. It's gonna be up on TV, but oh, yeah. you don't have to look up there. Oh. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Oh, wait, yeah. Mayor Campbell? Vice Mayor Samaglia? Commissioner Vignola? Here. Commissioner Daly? Here. Commissioner Carter? Present. City Manager Goodrum? Here. City Attorney Hearn? Here. Thank you. If we could, I'd like to have a moment of silence. And uh, I'd like to, if we could, in our own way, pray for the families of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas families. Um, they have been going through some hard times. Um, and I just like to remember them all and their loved ones. Thank you. Let's do a pledge of allegiance and uh, <clears throat> Joyce, could you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, before we get started with the proclamations, I'd like everybody to look at Commissioner Carter for a second. And I'd like you, all of you to tell me what color is her outfit? Two choices. Two choices. Thank you. No, he wins. Yeah. Burn orange. Told you. <laughs> Still orange. We're arguing. He's Wait until she gets next to the to I the red next trucks. To the fire truck, and I go orange because no, it's red. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, let's. let's <laughs> Our big day is in. year that we're doing this mayor and everyone else and we're very proud of that because I think we're one of the very few cities that do celebrate National Day of Prayer and uh, tomorrow at the Coral Springs Charter School we will be having a gathering in the evening of all our houses of worship that come to pray in the manner in which they're accustomed and what we pray for is our nation our leaders elected leaders our um, community and just praying for peace among all of us Everybody gets to speak. It's an honor to be a part of this committee, and it is a service we do. Uh, it's a calling on our lives to stand where others sometimes are not taking a stand to pray for our nation, our leaders, and the welfare of the people living in this country and those who aspire to make this a place of residence. It's a privilege. The National Day of Prayer, as Joyce said, has been going on for 30 years, and it is one of those times where we come together as a community to be able to say we can pray together in spite of our differences, no matter what our faith background is. It's a time where we are able to demonstrate that although we all believe differently, we can come together as citizens of a community and bless the community, that's the purpose behind it, and demonstrate that our differences, even our faith differences, don't have to divide us. Um, it will be Thursday night at the Charter School, 7 p.m., and we invite you all to be a part of it. It's a great time. The kids are the ones who pray, and so you don't have to listen to the 
older clergy guys. <laughs> we have our youngsters come in and they pray for a minute or two each and it's really beautiful because you see all the different traditions on display. Well, follow up to two clergy members, it's very hard. They have the gift of the word. But that's what I was going to add, that the children will lead us in prayer and it's, it's really cute and inspiring to see them. We have also some musical presentations, singers, and small acts just to bring us together and celebrate. Thank you. What you really got to know is clergy are only catalyst to prayer. Prayer is personal. Prayer is us to our maker, whoever we believe in. And um, although I love the clergy, they're merely the catalyst to get us to start thinking ourselves. So on behalf of the City Commission, each year our community comes together, regardless of our differences in faith, to pray for our nation and its leaders. As a city, we believe there is a strength in diversity, and this year marks the 30th celebration of this national event. Therefore, we, the City Commission of Coral Springs, proclaim May 3rd, 2018, as National Day of Prayer. Um, Randy, I'm going to give this to you. All right. Let's get a picture. Now, I'm going to ask you four to step outside. They're going to take another picture because we're trying to figure out as to what's best. So, and I'll see you tomorrow night, hopefully. And Chief Perry, are you here? All right. Chief McKeon, Chief Backer. Now you get to tell us what this is. Well, every year uh, I've been fortunate enough to go to Washington, D.C. on May 13th for the National Police Officers Memorial. Uh, that's when um, each year Thousands of law enforcement officers gather to honor the officers that the prior year have tragically and heroically given their lives in the performance of their duty. Uh, I am very uh, honored to go up there every year, and it really is a moving ceremony, and uh, definitely appreciate uh, the city commission uh, giving this proclamation to us. Say something, Sean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I have a long agenda today. Okay. Uh, we're just honored that the government and the folks and the citizens take time out of their schedule to recognize the efforts of police, not only for the Memorial, but Police Week in general. So uh, wish we didn't have to have that ceremony and we didn't have to have that wall, uh, but it's a moving tribute the way they handle it. Brad? Uh, just to follow up what uh, both the chief said here. I Going up there myself, it's a humbling experience. It, you, you come back there, honestly, a little bit safer, a little more aware, and then you come back also to an outreach from the community a lot of times with different trinkets or gifts or just letters from even from kids at schools, and, and it's pretty inspiring, it's pretty awesome. So thank you to the public, thank you to the commission, thank you to everybody who recognizes us. I would like to point out one more thing. There are gonna be 360 names added this year. Well, from a personal perspective, my brother, his first day as a Broward Sheriff's deputy uh, was serving a, an eviction uh, notice and some guy came out and shot and killed his partner. So this is very personal to me. And the other reason why my brother's not dead is the gun jammed. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a big issue. <clears throat> the Coral Springs Police Department plays an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of our residents. It's important that all citizens know and understand the responsibilities hazards and sacrifices that our police department accepts as their duty. During National Police Week, we ask that our residents join us in commemorating those dedicated law enforcement officers. Therefore, we, the City Commission of Coral Springs, proclaim the week of May 13th through 19th, 2018, as National Police Week. Their hands because I don't think they know you guys. And then also. 
So all go outside. Yeah, by make sure you guys go out. The three of you go outside to get a picture. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief Babinick. Let's get your crew down here. Mayor, as the uh, crews are, are making their way down, we have uh, two separate proclamations that we're doing today. One is um, a Firefighter Appreciation Day, and the other one is EMS Week. Um, <clears throat> you want to do them all at one time? Yes, sir if we could. Um, all of the members of the Coral Springs Fire Department are cross-trained in fire and EMS, and they're out serving their communities every day in both of those roles. Uh, we're very proud of the work that they do. Um, they do it at a very high level, and this community uh, um, benefits from their professionalism and their skill level. And it's, it's, uh, we're honored to have days that they are celebrated, and we appreciate uh, you guys, the community appreciates you guys and everything that you do. So thank you, Mayor and Commission, for recognizing us. Uh, Chief, you want to come on down and join? Oh, are you going to take a picture? Yes, All right, good. All right, let's do the International Firefighters Day. Firefighters dedicate their lives to the protection of life and property. International Firefighters Day is a time where the community can recognize and honor the sacrifices that firefighters make to ensure that their communities and environment are as safe as possible. We invite our community to remember the firefighters who have died while serving or have dedicated their lives to protecting us all. Therefore, we, the City Commission of Coral Springs, recognize May 4th, 2018 as International Firefighters Day. Now, Chief Cardona, I'm going to ask you on behalf of the EMS to say a couple words. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. We're happy and pleased uh, that uh, you have taken the time and the city has taken the time to recognize uh, us as the fire department on such an important date, right before Cinco de Mayo, by the way, so you can go celebrate the following day. But uh, you have a very uh, strong fire department here in Coral Springs, and we are proud of that. We are, we are uh, one of the best out there, and uh, we're innovative, and, uh, you know, we... We consider ourselves leaders in, in what we do, and we're very appreciative that we're able to do that, that kind of work with the support of our city and our commission. What is Cinco de Mayo? <laughs> it's a, the, day, the Day of the Dead for uh, you know, Mexico, so you get to celebrate that day, celebrate life. Good. Uh, special proclamation. Uh, our emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day. During this week, we recognize the value and the accomplishments of the emergency medical service providers and ask our residents to join us in thanking them. Therefore, we, the City Commission of Coral Springs, proclaim May 20th through the 26th, 2018, as Emergency Medical Services Week. Now let's get a picture. If we can come on in and get a little tight. Madam Clerk, uh, let's go on to public comment. Do we have any? 
Mayor, we have no signed speakers. Anybody out there want to speak? Seeing nothing, we're going to move on to public hearings and announcements, and there are none. Um, consent agenda. Does anybody want to remove anything from the consent agenda? To approve? Okay. All right, moved by Commissioner Daly, seconded by Commissioner Vignola. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Um, <coughs> moving on to Ordinance 2018-103. Uh, Mr. Hearn, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> this is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, amending Section 18-4.1 of the Code of Ordinances to allow mobile food vendors with a temporary use permit. Amending Section 1015 of the Land Development Code entitled Temporary Use Permits, creating Section 250159 of the Land Development Code to provide regulations for mobile food vendors, providing for conflict, providing for repeal, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for an effective date. Mayor's the second re um, reading request to approve and consistent with the Commissioner's motion uh, the Commission's motion that the, that the last meeting <clears throat> residential areas can have one or more food vendors before it was restricted to two or more. Okay, any questions? Mr. Hickey, do you want to say anything? I was just going uh, to run through the changes in the code just so that you all understand exactly what had changed. So if Matt can switch it over, I think we'd be able to go through it. You're recognized. So here's the, uh, the proposed changes. Um, this would be in item C, this would be the change. So currently in our pilot program, we, allow, we require two. Um, from the discussion that you had at the last meeting, we were going to allow a residential property to have one or more food, mobile food vendors. The other uh, change that's in the code is also that uh, temporary use permits, which we would require as part of the um, as part of this event, they're currently not allowed in residential, so we have to add that additionally to uh, Section 1015 of the Land Development Code. Oh, so there it is. So that would be the change that we would make. So unless authorized pursuant to Section 250159, that would be the temporary use permit section that we would have to amend as well. So the remainder of the mobile food vendors um, stays as you had seen it from the previous uh, commission. Just as an update, we did do some analysis on additional cities. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton, Hollywood, Tamarack, and Southwest Ranches, they require a temporary use permit, but they do not allow uh, mobile food vendors in residential districts. Um, Oakland Park and Palm Beach Gardens do. Uh, City of Parkland does as well. Uh, Parkland has requirements on blocking pedestrians and vehicles on the, the road rights of way. We did have some discussions with our, our fire department as well because they have some concerns that the, each food truck needs to be approximately 10 feet away from either the building or another food truck. So there are going to be instances where in some residential districts it just may not work because of logistics, because of right away, other issues that, that may occur. So you know, folks may come in for temporary use. We run that through all of our departments, but they may not be allowed depending on the safety of the, of the event and, and where it's located really. Uh, Commissioner Carter. How long would that process for approval generally take? Uh, we usually require we usually require folks to come in 30 days prior, but we can turn it around relatively quickly. We usually need at least a couple weeks. That gives us time in case uh, someone comes in and there's a way to change the plan. We can kind of move it around. And once once the plan changes, we have to have fire and everyone else take another look at it to make sure if the design or the plan has changed that everyone is is okay with it moving forward. We also allow so, in Cooper City. We'll, we'll check with that. Mr. Vignola. Um, adding residential to this, how, how many people have come to the city asking about, you know, why can't I do this at my home? We haven't received any, any calls. Mainly they've been for commercial, commercial districts looking to have an event or, or, you know, it's been that we've had a lot of demand for that. A regular temporary use permit for more of a commercial property, but not a residential that I would we know use of. It. As a realtor. Any other questions? Any motions? Second. Moved by Com Vice Mayor Smagley, seconded by Commissioner Daly. Let's discuss a little bit. Yes. Um, so the residential, if nobody's asking for it, why would we be adding it? You know, a lot of times residents will come to us about an issue that it's, it's a problem, whatever. My, my concern is, one, it's unenforceable. 
unless we have people all around the city all the time, you know, not every employee that drives around the city is going to see the food truck and say, hey, let me call this in and see if they have a permit. Um, I think we leave ourselves open to a lot of the problems um, with the ice cream trucks. I think if people go ahead and they park them out in a residential neighborhood and a kid comes around the corner and the way our roads here in South Florida are a little bit tighter, I hate to see an issue like we had 30 some odd years ago um, with, the, with the young kid and, and uh, the ice cream truck. Um, if, if our program's working, and, and, for, and I don't know how many years we've had it, five years, I think, something like that. At least um, since 2011. I've had nobody come to me and complain about it. And I don't want to get to the point with food trucks where we're competing with our restaurants, but I also don't want to get to it where we're opening ourselves up and it'll be hard for staff to distinguish and enforce between a typical mobile vendor and a food truck coming into uh, a specific permitted event. Uh, I, you know, if you want to go ahead and, and do that, not in a residential area, well then usually if you have a party that type of big, usually you do it at a park or something uh, a little bit different or, or at a, a business, the schools use them, I know. Um, I just have a really hard time with putting them out in a neighborhood and, and what type of parties are we going to be having if you have a bunch of food trucks in there, there uh, then parking is obviously going to be an issue because you have to support that business. And, and the traffic concerns, and especially with kids going up and down the street, so if, if we have any aspect of residential on this, I'm, I, I can't support it. Fine. Uh, any other comments? Discussion? All right, it's been moved by Vice Mayor Smagley, seconded by Commissioner Daly. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. All right, passes four to one. Moving on to uh, the item, Mr. Hickey, this is the third amendment and restated interlocal agreement for public school facility planning. Yes, and there are representatives from the school board. I think they're gonna come up and uh, I know there were some questions from the last meeting and they have some additional material if, uh, if necessary. Burgundy. Oh, you're welcome, yeah. Whatever, whatever you're comfortable doing. <clears throat> Let me try that. There you go. Thanks. Good morning, Leslie Brown, Chief Portfolio Services Officer. Thanks so much for having us back. Um, we had an opportunity to get some responses back to you from our last uh, conversation together. Um, and we're pleased to be back again this, this morning. I have with me Patrick Sippel. He is the um, director of, of our um, demographic and student assignment process. Um, so I know that there were some questions about the schools here in Coral Springs that we might be able to um, talk to you all about. And then I also have with me Lisa White from our um, real estate and facility management planning team and Chris Acabuso, the director of that team also, okay? So um, I think right now, if, if it's your pleasure, uh, if, we, if you would like us to share some information about um, the schools and the boundaries, we can do that. Or if we'd like to entertain questions first, and, and we, we don't have a planned presentation because I think um, there were some questions that needed to be asked, and we're here to... Let's go so. to anybody who have a question. I got a few. Okay, Commissioner right, Vignola, you're ahead. recognized first. Um, first off, um, I know the district is anti-redoing the boundaries. I know that's like, we want to avoid that, especially um, this time of year. Um, everyone wants to, to avoid that in a year like this. But when we look at the district and, and looking at Coral Springs in particular, and I'm gonna go right to where I live. Where I live, I used to live very close to Maplewood. I was zoned for Westchester. I moved two thirds of the way to Westchester and now I'm zoned for Maplewood. Um, there are a lot of little things like that that over the years and not redistricting has created some issues. Um, and I don't know at what point are we gonna go ahead and address that, but I, I can almost hit Westchester with a rock. And I'm much closer to Westchester than people that drive by my house to go to school. Yet I gotta go from basically near Coral Ridge and Royal Palm Boulevard to the school that I'm assigned to over by Sam's Club on University. Um, you know, at what point is the district gonna go ahead and say, okay, well, you know, as the county is basically built out almost, right? It's time to go ahead and really look at where these boundaries need to be. Because I, I feel like we're always putting band-aids on things when it comes to districting the schools. And that's an issue. Okay, so um, in the work that we do with boundaries is we go through a boundary process every single year. Um, the district um, is required to make boundary changes when we take a look at um, state required um, issues such as class size reduction or level of service. So we take a look at the broader scope across the whole district um, on an annual basis. 
there's also an opportunity for communities that are interested in a line changing to submit proposals during that process for us to help facilitate that. We'll have community meetings. We actually meet with um, homeowners associations, schools, set up meetings for community members to come in. And actually it's, it's Patrick and I that go out and help facilitate those meetings to get community input on any of those types of changes. The board is very open um, to looking at changes you know, for specific community interest areas. Um, and that process actually begins, we have a workshop on May 15th to begin that. Um, and then the window opens for any community proposals that come forward because the communities know their schools almost better than we do. The, the reasons for us to have to do district-wide redistribution of students is basically um, when conditions will not allow children to attend a school because of space. So um, changing a line uh, for, for um, another reason is something why the board opened it up for community members to put in other ideas for us to take a look at. So when we look at space, right now, I'll, I'll take up, you know, sure. if you look up here in our area, uh -huh. um, we have one school that's at 102% capacity, mm -hmm. the high school. Then we have other schools in the area that have many seats open for reassignment. Um, you would think that the way the school district would want to be, you'd have open seats equally distributed amongst all the schools. Um, and, and that creates some, uh, some issues for us um, as far as, you know, having all these open seats here and then some people are, are going further away to go to the school that they're distributed for when boundaries could be shifted and moved to, to make those adjustments. Uh, cl class size things, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, how else to say it, but smoke and mirrors. Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of that that's been happening uh, a lot of times at the school board. I, I don't like the fact of allowing any changes with class size requirements because my, my daughter's in a classroom with 43 other kids and two teachers and a faculty training room that has no windows, which I believe is against state law. Um, they have no working intercom system, which I know is against state law. Um, and they're thrown in there to create space and the other things so they can have more kids come and reassign for funding. And that, that's my opinion of, of why that's done. I, I can't uh, speak to why that decision was made, but I think that's, uh, you know, for, for a fifth grader to be in a room like that where the air condition doesn't even work properly enough, but they have to bring in a portable AC unit that makes noise that the teachers don't want to put on because um, it's too noisy to, to teach over. I think that's that's an issue. And, and when you go around to the various schools, it seems like there's always some type of numbers game being played, and, and it's concerning for me. And, and we could sit here and, and discuss this for probably about 10 days and not get to the root of it. I think the commission, as we should in the future at a workshop, have a long discussion on school boundaries and things and class size stuff and, and see as a city what position we're going to be taking. Um, so we did bring, uh, if you have a specific issue about a specific class, I'm happy to come and meet with you on it. I also manage class size for the school district based on state law. So I'm happy to come out, take a look at that um, with you and your particular child and that particular school. What, and Here's the problem. Uh -huh. That principal is my wife's boss. Again, I am so it's, happy it's to come out. It's kind of tough for me to, you know what I'm saying? But I'm I think absolutely that as, as a policy district-wide, we, we, yeah. should, we should see those problems, identify them, and, and that should be solved on its own internally. Again, I, I'm ha unless we know about the issue, um, we have a whole team that helps the schools work with this, and I'm happy to work with you on it. And then as far as the boundaries, if it's something that you would like us to come back and do a workshop with you with the Commission on Boundaries, we actually brought all the data with us this morning, and I know your, your schedule and your timing is tight, but we're happy to come back and look at a boundary workshop with you all, as well as share any data that any of the commissioners are interested in in class size. Okay. Okay? Thanks. Any other questions? I just have a, <coughs> Commissioner have a clarification question. So regardless of where the school is located, for example, Douglas and Parkland, Terra Bella and Coral Springs, the percentage of students that go from that city has no bearing because it's boundary lines. And here my point is, is when I was reading the statistics of how many Coral Springs kids go to Terra Bella, and it was only 36%, and it was like 44% came from Tamarack, and um, another percentage came from Sunrise. That surprised me. Is it so like let us show you that map because I think that's a, that's a very important question. Um, you're absolutely correct. The state law does not allow us to um, draw boundary lines specifically based on municipalities because the, the, the state itself does not fund us by municipalities. It funds us as a total district. 
So um, we take a look at the numbers of residing students and um, work on the boundaries based on the residing as well as the attending students through a cohort methodology of students moving through the system, mm -hmm. um, as well as look at, at birth rates, particularly at the elementary level, uh, to get our numbers. Um, so on the map, um, for the high school map, you will see um, that is absolutely correct. Um, you are going to see that Terrabella High School is directly, can we? Bob, why don't we, we come on up here and help? I know the numbers. Is, okay. is directly on the border between Tamarack and Coral Springs. Correct. Oh, here it is. Um, it's on your third tab. Yeah. On your computer okay. screen. So you're going to see that bottom little triangle uh, um, with the flag, that is um, Taravella High School. And uh, Patrick, can you just kind of draw a line around the actual boundary for Taravella High School? Just so that they can third see tab, the orientation. It goes from here all the way down. Uh, yes. So when, when, as a district, when we look at, and this is just very clinical, when we look at how many bodies will fill in, it will fit into a school, we have to draw the lines around the residing students within a particular area to actually fill that building. So as we continue to look at the numbers and, and demographics do change, we are seeing some shifting. Um, we do have an overlay on this where you see the Coral Springs Charter School. Um, you're going to see the dots, all of the dots. Those are the students um, that attend the Coral Springs Charter School. So you're going to see um, that within the Taravella area, uh, there are a significant number of dots in that area that attend Coral Springs. So um, if we only had students residing from the city of Coral Springs in J.P. Taravella High School, it would be significantly under-enrolled. Um, and as you know, um, a school is funded based on the number of students that are actually attending the school. Um, so, so there's this interesting um, dichotomy of when you have um, four or, you know, or five, um, if you're uh, including the, the charter school, uh, the numbers of schools that we I, as, assign to a, a, a building, it, the boundary may overlap into another city. And in this case, it's about half and half, where half of the students um, are, that are bounded to the school um, attend Taravella from Tamarack and about half uh, from Coral Springs. Does that, does that answer your question? It's 36.9%. Okay, so let me. 36% for Coral Springs kids in that school. So, so I'm going to share again that that's the attending. Okay, so the 36% um, is recognizing how many actually attend. It's not recognizing that particular number is the residing. So when we draw the boundaries, we cannot draw the boundaries based on who's attending the school. State law requires us to draw the boundaries based on how many students live within that area. So I can't, I can't just draw about who chooses to go to Taravella High School. I have to draw the boundary based on the, the numbers of bodies that live in a certain area, numbers of students that live in a certain area um, to fill that school. With the, the onset of charter schools, I mean, as you know, we have 93 charter schools in Broward County. Um, so the, the school board, as well as the district, is not anti-charter, but it is another tool in the toolbox of parents being able to make choices um, to attend a different school. And as, as we know from our side, two years ago, state statute said that we must provide choice for any family that wants to go to a school where there's a seat. That's state law. Okay. Um, we try very hard to manage that based on space um, and seats available. We don't just say whoever wants to go anywhere can go anywhere. We actually match it seat by seat. So as you can see, the students that in the city of Coral Springs that are assigned to Taravella, that go, that choose to go to the charter school, that's an empty seat at Taravella. So if there are families at Coral Glades that want to go to Taravella, we allow them to go. That's state law. If we have families from Coral Springs that want to go to or Sunrise, Tarabella, or, or Sunrise or Tamarack, okay. that's state law. Um, so our goal is to try and um, maintain an enrollment at schools that provides the most resources 
and equity for children to be able to have choices of lots of different things at that school. Okay. Um, so it's interesting, and I, and I certainly appreciate the question, Commissioner Carter. Thank Commissioner Vignola. So, so my, my thing about having kids from Coral Springs attend Coral Springs schools isn't, uh, I mean, the plain and simple thing, February 14th took place right here in our community. We have 1,502 kids that live in Coral Springs that go to Stoneman Douglas High School. Um, their parents pay tax, taxes in Coral Springs. They pay for our police department which is awesome. Um, our police department's not at Stoneman Douglas, unfortunately. Um, so that's, that's something that, that bothers me. When you look at the resources that we put into our schools, where, if, if, if a reassignment, if you look at the, the Stoneman Douglas zone and how that goes all the way deep into Coral Springs, sure. it goes, mm -hmm. there, there's people that live where I grew up that are closer to Glades, Coral Springs High, and Taravello that are zoned for Douglas. It seems like the way the district's always drawn is Stoneman Douglas always stays right about 100% capacity and our other schools hover way down lower and, and have all the reassignments and things. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that's, that's a concern. Um, you know, the, the talking about making things equitable and district-wide, I get it. I, I wish the school board would go ahead and say, hey, you know what, we're, we're gonna pay for school security. We're gonna go ahead and, and make the upgrades to, to make our kids safe. I don't feel that's happening. I hear people say, hey, you know, we're getting only 47 cents more per student um, this year, but how many of those cents per student is going to school safety, school security upgrades? Um, you know, that's that's a concern for us. If they were all in Coral Springs schools, and then look, my, my personal opinion is, is at one point this commission is going to have to make a decision in the next 15 to 20 years of, hey, you know what, for, for what we get bang for our buck, we're better off building more charter schools and making every kid in Coral Springs able to go to a Coral Springs uh, charter, whether it be middle or high school. That, that's what I think where we're going. It seems like we're always getting the short end of the stick. Um, when it comes to certain things and, and to see here we are, we're in May and I don't see any of those 47 cents getting directed for school security and school safety. 35% of kids at Taravella from Coral Springs, 55% from Coral Springs High School, 88% from Coral Glades and 45% from Stoneman Douglas. Um, it seems to me if we move those numbers around, we can kind of go ahead and, and make it where we're able to better protect our children. And that's so I, I really appreciate your comments on student safety. I think it is critical and, and in the front of all of our minds before, after, during, and for the, for the rest of our lives together. So I think it's important to understand that um, the 47 cents was actually a shift of dollars um, to the safety allocation from the state. We have no control over um, how those decisions are made at the state level. We are going to receive eight million sixty-five thousand twelve dollars out eight million. No, no, before that, you said that the forty-seven cents is for school safety. The forty-seven cents is when they shifted funds from um, FTE, which is our student allocations, to safety dollars. Who shifted? That's what the state legislation. legislation. Okay, I, I, Okay, that, that, that is did, what happened. I did happened. not know that, but yeah, okay. Yeah, the 47 cents is not for safety. It is what they promised a certain increase per student FTE at up, the beginning of the support. session yep. is, you know, and it's a part of the process. What ended up happening is that promised FTE was shifted to school safety funds, which the state actually allocated, excuse me, <clears throat> across the state, 97.5 million. Broward County's portion of that 97.5 is about eight, $28, $29,000 per school in the district. Yeah, yeah. Eight million sixty-five uh, zero one twelve, and that eight million dollars must also be uh, be a pro rata share per FTE to the charter schools. So it's actually not going just to the schools in the district. It also covers the pro rata share, um, which is interesting because the state law says that it's supposed to fund an SRO. Um, in every school, or the guidelines include that. However, it is, it is nowhere near the amount of funding needed to do that, as, as you all can tell by the map. So, so, mm -hmm. so we had, you know, up until a few years ago, and it was kind of my battle, I guess, with, with the, the school board, and sure. they had said they were gonna fund 50%. They made it their policy to fund 50% of the cost of SROs to the municipalities, and this was before um, the economy went south. Um, they were paying us $15,000 per school uh, resource. So officer. actually, they it was now to 46,000. 46, $15,000 for many years, and the SRO costs us. It, it over actually is 46,000. And now and, it is, I said. But before and, they were paying And us again, it's been 46,000 during my tenure. It's been since It's been 46,000 during my tenure. So um, I can only speak to the, the time that I right, and I, Mr. Runcie have been um, working on that program. So, so, so and we um, we've had some very us. good. Wait, 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 wait. 
We've had some very let's, good. Let's let one person Sorry. speak at a time. <laughs> Thank you. And don't have over speaking. Thank you. But there was a court reporter here. She'd go crazy, or he'd go crazy. Thank so you, Mayor. So go ahead and finish, and then I appreciate it. Commissioner Vignola can ask further questions. I think it's important to um, see the history of the school board working with the city of Coral Springs. Um, I believe Mayor Campbell and other uh, commissioners have been working on coming up with the other part of that money and building more um, school resource officers. It is a partnership, um, and we've been very blessed to have that partnership with the city of Coral Springs. Um, the, the challenge is, is as we continue to be funded for education, um, the funding for um, safety and security, just as, as all of us, it, it could be something that could happen anywhere in our community. Um, those funds are being shifted from the education part of our work to safety and security as, as fully recognized by what legislation just recently did. We currently have a bid out for the needs assessment, so um, it's, it's, it's going very, very well, so we're on it. Um, the actual um, RLI has been done. Uh, the team is meeting today with um, multiple uh, companies that have been suggested and have put in a, a, a letter of intent, um, so that process is moving forward. Um, we're very, very proud of the fast work that we're doing on that to get a third party that is what we heard from the constituents is to not have the district itself do that analysis for um, safety assessment. Um, so an external group is coming in um, and we will be sharing that with the board, um, let me see, um, very, very soon. Um, it'll be um, um, late July where we will have all of that work done and then presenting to the board um, as far as short-term and long-term results of that assessment. Okay. Okay, so going um, back here a little bit with, with okay, I, I know it's 46,000 now, but we had to fight for that. In fact, uh, the school board took a stance and Mr. Renzi took a stance when we were adding SROs back in the, uh, uh, around 2014, we were adding SROs to elementary schools and we were told we weren't gonna be reimbursed for those. Um, and that was a battle back and forth for a solid year. Um, with the city of Coral Springs and the school board, just so you're aware there. And, and you know, the, the concern is the fact of the, the, the snail's pace that the district works in. Um, and I'm gonna give you a prime example. Um, 568 days ago, somebody walked onto Coral Springs High School's campus with a, um, with a gun, okay? Um, the bond vote, the safety part of the smart bond was 1,274 days ago. Um, still, Coral Springs High School doesn't have the single point of entry. And that's something that the plans were drawn before the economy went down and they had. The money was given to the district in 2014, and yet here we are, 1,274 days later, and they still don't have their single point of entry, which now the plans have changed a little bit, and, and it's, it's honestly, it's, um, it's disheartening to say the least. Um, I, I just, for, for me looking at it, and, and my wife's a public school teacher here in the district, um, my, my kids, um, well, two of my kids go to the regular traditional public schools. My, my oldest one does not, thank God. We have the Coral Springs Charter School. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot of things we have to look at, and, and one of them, I think, is redistricting. And, 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 and I'll be honest with you, the, I know you said the board is in favor of it. I've talked to three school board members about this specific issue and, and about what I was saying about the zones out over here, and I had three different school board members tell me, yeah, they're, they're not in favor of doing that. And, and it's because it's election time, um, and we're heading to that point. Um, I, I just would hope that we would go ahead and look to treat all schools equally and fairly as far as, you know, the amount of seats that are open throughout them and, and find out a way to do that because unfortunately more and more kids are wanting to leave Terrebonne. There should be no need for the Coral Springs Charter School. Years ago there was no need for the Coral Springs Charter School. But would you see the numbers on that map with Taravella and the amount of kids from Taravella trying to go into the Coral Springs Charter School, that number keeps getting higher and higher. There's a reason for that. And, and I, I think that's very, very concerning for the district, for the city, and, and for the, the students and the parents um, around. So, but yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna go ahead and support them playing numbers games and, and counting portables that are empty and, and faculty training rooms or whatever and playing the class size things. And I think that's probably the best way to say it. I think as a commission though, we need to sit down and decide where we're gonna invest our time and money towards schools. Because I, I think there's, um, there's some options for us that we, we should start looking at now. Thank you. Any other uh, discussions? Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Hickey, what is your suggestion? Where are you? 
Well, this was for discussion today, so we can bring the item back at the next meeting and um, bring it to a vote. So it would be to, uh, to approve the third amendment to the interlocal agreement. One of the things that I, I would like to uh, just put on the record sure. is, as you know, I was intricately involved with getting those SRO officers, and Mr. Runcie and I and our former city manager met multiple times. I am convinced, and I hate to say this, that our high schools need at least two SRO officers. Uh, you know, we, we got small cities, uh, 3,000 students, uh, and to have one SRO officer, I think, is very difficult. Now, one of the problems we got is finding SRO officers uh, because there's a lot of openings in law enforcement today. Um, and I think it's something that we have to bring up as a city to the school superintendent and the school board. And I'm bringing it up today since this is open for discussion. And I also agree with Commissioner Vignola that this single uh, point of entrance is an issue that he's been talking about for as long as I've been on this commission, and I don't see anything being done. Um, you know, it's, the school board has to understand that when we pass that bond issue for 800 million, um, we expected to see some type of results, and we just haven't seen it in Coral Springs. And I can tell you from this building alone, when we allocated the money to build it, it came in, the bids came in at about, if I recall, 50% higher than we anticipated. And I suspect that that $800 million that school board got, how many days ago was it? Over 1,200. Over 1,200 is probably going to be worth 30% of what we thought it was worth over 1,200 days ago. So we really have to get some action, I, I guess, by the school board. I think the school board uh, and the school superintendent should know that we as a city uh, are going to start demanding that type of action because it's our tax dollars that's uh, being spent. Yeah. Commissioner, so, Commissioner Daly first. Real quick, just a quick question. Jim, if we, I, I know you said you're going to bring it back for uh, formal approval. If we don't approve it, what, what happens? I, I think the, the school board can probably answer that, but they're required to, let me see if I get this right, they need to have 50% of the municipalities that are within the ILA that represent 75% of the population in order to approve the, the Third Amendment. And I know, oh, is it opposite? Uh, sorry. So 75% of the cities representing 50% of the population um, would, have to, would have to approve the, the ILA. And I know they have, I think they can probably provide us with an update. I know there's two other communities that they're, that they're currently working with. Commissioner Vignola. Nope, hold on if I can. Sorry, Commissioner Dillon, sorry. Yeah. sorry. So one of the things that, um, that we are in the interlocal agreement, the, the, re the question for approval deals with whether or not a school can continue or, or the district can continue to use relocatables as a part of level of service. Um, we have a significant um, relocatable reduction plan that's been going on that you all have been a part of. We also are seeing a reduction in the overall footprint of space um, in relation to the amount of students that we're serving. So the request is, is to approve whether or not if a school has relocatables, if the school is able to continue to use those relocatables, um, if, if a school goes over uh, its capacity, its permanent capacity, or should we have to take other measures to serve the needs of those children? The, the biggest shift, um, as you can see by the map of, the, of uh, Coral Springs, is um, when we start talking boundaries, um, parents have significant choices. Uh, they, will, they like to go to their neighborhood school. They like to be in Coral Springs, the families that are in Coral Springs. Um, and when we start to have to go into uh, boundary changes to shift them outside of their kind of neighborhood type school, um, they do leave the school district. Uh, and um, our goal is to try and continue to use the space that the families see on the campus appropriately. Some schools have relocatables, some don't, so the level of service request for the amendment is that a school be able to use whatever they have on their campus. So where are you today 
in terms of getting the necessary approval with 75%, 50%. Lisa White, there are 27 uh, signator, municipal signatories uh, to the interlocal agreement. I'm sorry, there's how many? There are 27 Out of the municipal 31. signatories. Okay. Um, yes. And so we need 21 cities to approve the ILA before it just becomes effective to all the signatories. And we're at 18 now. right now. We have two scheduled for a vote today. So um, perhaps by the end of the day we'll have 20 or still 18 or 19. <laughs> But so you need the actual hard number of 21. 21, not necessarily based on population size. Well, right. So if you have the 75% of the municipalities, no matter how you divvy it up, you automatically have the 50%. So the real threshold you need to get is the 75% is the of the signatories. Because you can't get 75% even if they're all the small cities without already having the 50. If right, what's the sense. timeline? It's um, We had hoped to uh, complete this process by the end of April, just so that we'd be ready to start the school year with a new level of service, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So we have a few more um, cities we're working with to try and schedule in June. So then we'd have to amend policy. So we'd be looking, if that goes successfully in the next month and we're able to garner enough votes, then we would probably look at like an October implementation to get through our policy amendments that would be necessary to implement from our side. Commissioner Vigdal, so to your point, Mr. Mayor, about you know costs going up and things, um, Cypress Bay High School alone, from their $9.3 million estimate um, at the time that the bond was floated, uh, went up to $19.2 million for the cost of that project. Um, there, there is a, uh, besides the cost of the square footage increase, um, the original proposal did not account for corridors, stairwells, elevators, equipment rooms, um, along with labs, special education, classes, administration, and restrooms. Um, that's according to the, the Sun Sentinel. Um, the concern is those costs are going to continue going up as they start getting closer and closer to other projects. They put $220 million in reserve set aside to handle the increased costs for the projects. However, if they're going up by 100%, things are going to get scaled back. That's just what's going to happen. Um, I, I, and when, when Cypress Bay and Cypress Bay's money is for, you know, they, they enroll about 4,700 kids and it was built for 3,288 kids. Stoneman Doug is at 102% capacity. Um, you know, instead of building new buildings and stuff and there's capacity within the district, I don't know why we're not going ahead and, and going along with a redistricting process to adequately put the kids in the proper schools where it's already there and we can use that money for actual funding for things so that that way teachers have, you know, paper and, and certain things to go ahead and, and run their classrooms. But um, that's, that is a big thing as, as time goes on and we're going to be over the four year mark shortly um, since the bond was passed, is the cost going to continue to rise. Through the mayor? Yes. Um, I would just like to share um, with the commission and your community uh, that the board is fully aware and planning for increasing costs, um, and the board is totally committed to completing um, the projects and the scope within them. They can't do it. It's, if he talks about smoke and mirrors, it can't be done. So what, I, what, we I, had, what we had planned on for four years ago, uh, you can't do all those projects because you you're not going to have the money. You're going to have to either have a new bond or you're going to do less of your planning. I mean, I'm talking from our experience with this particular city hall. And we didn't think that we would ever have to put more money in the city hall, but it had to happen because we got the lowest bid. Uh, and the lowest bid came in, uh, and I was shocked when it came in at how much money we paid. Our fire department, uh, we, we put four new fire stations, and I was shocked at the cost of building those things. Uh, but that's for the public safety for our, for our city, right. and we had to do it. That's right. Uh, I just don't see how the school board, or Mr. Runcie, is able to come and look at us and say, we're able to do everything we said four years ago for 800 million bucks. Won't happen. Can't happen. So I appreciate your um, concerns. They are on the forefront of everyone's minds, and we absolutely are staying true to the commitment for the scope of what was promised to the community. The uh, single point of entry projects have been moved up. Um, the, there are a number of them that will be completed by June, and there is a commitment to have them all done by first quarter of uh, the 2019 school year. So I, I appreciate, I believe very truly that the board as well as Mr. Renzi holds a lot of the same concerns that this commission does um, and we are continuing to work true to the scope of what was promised to the community. Thank you. 
by the way, thank you for coming, and I'm sorry that you had to be the one taking our. Okay. We're and it's not. We'll, I'm sorry. We'll it's keep not coming back because we want to anything, continue but. to work with you all. And Commissioner Vignola, like I said, um, I'll have my assistant reach out. We'll come up. We'll meet um, on the boundary issue. Um, we have a lot of data um, that we can share and get your thoughts. All right, thank so you. we're happy to do that. Right. Okay. Okay. That was a good discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. This is videotaped if you want to go back and show them the beating you took. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, direction is to... Uh, the, the direction is it's going to come back to the next yep, meeting. To the brain back. So okay. it just uh, nothing happens. Yep. Okay. Uh, Commission Communications, we're going to start with Commissioner Carter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to remind everybody that this is the beginning of May, and on the first Saturday in May, there is the Silent Peace Walk that's held at 7 a.m. at the center, which is formerly known as the City Center. Anytime you want to communicate with me, feel free to call me at 954-998-4186. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Vice Mayor Samaglio. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, I want to thank the military for doing what they do so we can do what we do. And again, kudos again to the police and fire. Uh, every week, it's something else. You guys just going on, getting better and better. We're really proud of that. And uh, I just want to say, I was at all the weekend events that we had outside on the lawn. Is Liz here? I think I've told you already this, but I want to do it publicly. You and your staff did one bang up job for all the events we had, how to, uh, we had out here this weekend. I walked around the entire time, all three days, and I'm going to tell you, we got nothing but compliments. Not one complaint. But there was somebody at the door with a little sign, have a complaint, go this way. Because I have one, I'll send them to the mayor anyway. I don't handle complaints. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, just a beautiful job the, the entire weekend, and, uh, and, and we talked about some of the stuff that we're going to, you know, we looked at for, for, future, uh, for future events. Um, just want to remind everybody that uh, Memorial Day weekend, on Memorial Day, we'll be having ser services out at, uh, at uh, Veterans Park. And if you need to contact me, I am available at all times, 954-801-2004. My office hours are the first Monday of every month. Thanks, Mayor. Commissioner Vignola. Um, first off, Mother's Day is coming up, so happy Mother's Day to the moms out there. Thank you. Um, um, the other day I was... Uh, asked to go speak to the city of Coconut Creek and Margate where they have their, their principals meeting with all their principals about uh, team political form and this success that they thought it was. Um, also, I was interviewed about it um, by a couple people from the BBC um, about how successful they thought it was and they're doing a whole program on, on the events of Stoneman Douglas and they, they thought that was a, a really impactful thing and they said they, they see why some of the kids here are so vocal as they are. Um, Unfortunately, I guess, I guess, or, or maybe fortunately, things things are so quiet in Coral Springs that we had a whole discussion again on team political reform when I was not here um, at the last meeting. Um, you know, the, and just so everyone's aware what what took place, I was walking into a meeting um, with the team political reform kids, our, our last meeting before the event, and this was about 48 hours before the event. And I came in, and, and Joyce Campos, who uh, is our staff liaison to the to the committee, said, "Hey, Stacy Kagan from the city of Parkland." wanted to know if it was okay for her to attend the event, sit in the audience. And she said, of course, you know, it's a public meeting. Anyone can come in, but it's, it's geared towards teens. Um, so I told the students that were sitting over here as I was sitting over there um, what was going on. And they said, hey, you know, we'd like to invite her to the event. That's why Stacy Kagan was invited. I didn't reach out to Stacy Kagan and invite her. It wasn't a me decision, whatever. I think um, it's not a Parkland event, it's a Coral Springs event, but based off the fact that a lot of kids um, in Coral Springs, that live in Coral Springs, go to school at a school that the SRO is hired by the city of Parkland, um, I thought it was a good idea that the kids decide to do that. And the kids every year, they decide who they want to invite. Some years, we'll send letters to the president, as we did this time. Some years, we won't. Sometimes, we'll, they'll invite the supervisor of elections. Sometimes, they won't. Um, you know, but. But what happened was Stacy said she was going to be coming to the event. Um, so the kids decided to invite her. Um, as far as Sunshine Law and giving advice to commissioners, did not happen. Fake news. Don't know where you got that from. Did not happen. Didn't give any commissioner advice on the Sunshine Law or anything like that. 
So I don't know where you're getting your information, but that's not true. But I do think that at any time that we have this event, we notice it because they could ask um, uh, the vice mayor a question about something. Well, I don't want everyone thinking that that's the city perspective. And I might go, hey, you know what? For me, I, I disagree with that. And we can have that discussion. Um, so for me, I think it's good that it's, it's sunshine and noticed. Um, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, Mr. Mayor, you said the vice mayor Parkin being there created a problem with some of our folks. Um, but more from Parkland, who was upset that we didn't invite her mayor, and then you correct yourself said their mayor. Um, I'd like to know who, who complained to you. Because I, I, I didn't get one complaint from anybody except for a blogger. A blogger is the only one that reached out to me the day before the event. Um, and I could show you the text message that I received to her from her because I'm, I'm a little perturbed that here we are once again talking about a nationally award winning event as if it was something bad and we're apologizing. Um, the blogger texted me. Um, did you ask the mayor of Parkland to be on the panel? Question mark. Why Stacy? Well, she's a blogger and I don't have to respond to her. I was at my daughter's school. Um, she said, please consider contacting her instead. When I contacted her in between events that I was at the school, um, she wanted me to invite her mayor instead of her vice mayor. Um, but that's not how it works. Bloggers don't make decisions for team political form. I, I don't make the decisions for the team political form. And I think what people care to realize is this event used to have 300, 350 kids every year. Then we gave control of it to the kids. And um, we've seen it grow, and, and that's why we have so many people. Um, I know, Mr. Mayor, you said you really want to know the answers about that. that that's what happened. That's all that was. Um, I didn't even know the mayor of Parkland was coming until I was up on stage and saw her sitting there. Um, even then, one of the kids who was there uh, who's the liaison to the Broward County School Board and knows a lot of the elected officials from around, um, said that he spoke to her um, and that she was sick and lost her voice. So even at that, I don't know why this is an issue. Um, and, and ultimately, the mayor over the vice mayor over a commissioner, there is no difference. And you said it yourself. The next day when we were sitting here after the meeting, we were sitting here greeting the people from the government academy. We're all one vote. We all represent the same people. Now, maybe in different ways. Maybe you feel the city needs to improve in this way, and Dan feels that needs to improve in this way, right? But together, we make that decision. It's not the mayor's decision versus the other. We don't have a strong mayor system. Um, you know, and, and, and honestly, Mr. Mayor, it's so important to have the mayor there. I mean, you've missed half of them since you've been on the commission. So, and, and, and it's not a knock on you, and I know you've had valid excuses, but it doesn't make a difference as long as we have somebody that will answer these, these kids' questions. Um, you were told that I saw an opinion and was told uh, that the mayor of Parkland could not be on the dais. Again, that's not true. I did not seek an opinion. I don't know who told you I saw an opinion. I never told anybody I saw an opinion. Um, and, and, and look, I mean, since, since we should know answers to the topic, I, I'd like to know who questioned you on this and, and who specifically told you that I went ahead and ask that question. And, and, and part of the reason why I'm upset, Mr. Mayor, is because a week before we had a meeting and we talked about no surprises, things like that, and we had a workshop, this would have been the perfect time to bring that up and ask me, hey, Larry, you know, who, who asked you about this? You know, who, who, why did you do it this way and not invite this one, whatever? It, it was literally, hey, the kids said, do it, all right, fine. And, that, and that's it. I wasn't going to sit there and play games. The kids are working on a script for a long time. These kids and I were, and Mr. Mayor, with all due respect, I guarantee I spent more hours with this group of kids this year than you have with all your committees since you've been in, in the mayor seat. And, and, I, and I mean that, I, I bust my tail for those kids. And I do all types of things and I go to the schools, I hand out flyers to advertise to get kids involved. So that, that way, one day we're all gonna be replaced with the, well, not specifically Dan Daly, but the Dan Daly's of the world <laughs> that started their, their political career, a team political form. And, and that's a, a big thing with me and, and, and so, for me to sit there and last minute go to make changes because a blogger wants to have her mayor there is just disgusting to me. And these kids have a script and they're working on it. And look, people dropped out last minute and these kids have to sit there and make changes or whatever. They come up with questions, they do all different things and there's a rundown and that rundown isn't just for them. It's also the people that work the cameras and do the audio and all those different things. There's a lot of work that goes into this that people don't understand. And just because a blogger 24 hours before the event wants to add a kid. And she did this to me a few years ago too. She wanted to take out the prayer that the Coalition's Christian Academy kids do before the event, um, you know, right before the event and, and at like five o'clock. It's like, no, not happening. Um, I don't know why team political form becomes this issue, but it is. And, and, and literally, Mr. Mayor, I, I really want to know, I'm, I'm asking you, who, who has contacted you on this and made an issue out of this? Because you said some Coral Springs residents and but mostly from Parkland. And, and I don't want to know because there's somehow, some way, someone's giving you misinformation and then without contacting me, you go ahead and, and say it at a commission meeting, which you know, we had the opportunity a week before. So yeah, I, I was kind of pissed. I was getting text messages 
while I was at a school board meeting for public safety about what was happening here, that again, here we were talking about team political form, which I mean, people from the British Broadcasting Corporation said they, they were so impressed that they never saw anything like it. And we're making like it's a negative thing out there so a headline could be run saying that you publicly apologize to the mayor of Parkland for something that we don't control. It's the kids event. So, so who, who did brought that issue to you? Commissioner Vignola, this is history. Congratulations on the awards. Let's move on. I'm, I'm not gonna move on and, and I'm gonna ask you here publicly as a public records request for any documents, electronic communication or phone calls you see regarding this issue. Sure, because it, it, to, to me, this, this is not a dead issue. This is an important issue. You know, and, and again, the kids from this event and the kids from this community are out there. And to me, they're the leaders out there. And we've, as elected officials across the board, top to bottom, have dropped the ball on many issues. And, and you know what? I think maybe we should let some of these kids make, make some of these decisions. And that's why this event is, has been good. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and there, there are other things that we can get into on things that were said at commission meetings and stuff that I don't think were true and known not to be true. Um, but again, we, we had a meeting a week before and it, it's upsetting to me that it wasn't brought up then. Hey, Larry, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And, and my guess is it was because the blogger asked. And, that's, and, and no one's ever going to change my mind on that. And, and I hope this is the end of it. And I hope we don't sit there and do it. And, and for everyone up here, the kids make the decisions as to who's invited and what we do and how the programs run. Our, our, what we do with me and the staff is help guide them into a way where we can make it work. And that's why this event's successful. So with that, I'm gonna go on to some other issues. Mike, thank you for getting that traffic light fixed. I got out of there much quicker this morning. I'm not stuck over there. Um, I was able to help the Taravella band. They invited me to go ahead. There's a lot of Dan Daly fans over there, actually, the Taravella band, um, reveal their theme for next year. And they literally had cutouts of your face on sticks. Um, as they did me at Team Political Forum and at the event. Not, um, but I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, I know everyone was busy and schedules up, but the Coral Springs High School's art gallery that opened last week that we were invited to go to. Art gallery? The Coral Springs High School opened an art gallery inside oh, okay. their school. I didn't hear and, that. Um, out of clay, they made various buildings and monuments and things around the city of Coral Springs. Um, I offered the kid to buy one of them. Uh, the little sun out over here that we just put in made a perfect little model of it. Um, it's really cool, it's extremely impressive. I think we're gonna work with the museum to put it in over there, but I would definitely ask you guys if you get an opportunity to go out and check that out. Um, Coral Springs Charter School won the regional tennis championship um, with mostly seventh and eighth graders and some sixth graders. Um, they're heading to states, which is extremely impressive. Coral Springs Charter School won the softball district championship again last week. Um, Today at four o'clock, they play at Betty Stradling Park. Um, they're starting their regionals on their way to hopefully win their fourth straight state title. Um, I'd like to thank the PTA from Country Hills Elementary. Um, that their fundraiser Friday night and at the end of the event, they had a whole bunch of pizzas left over and they came over to me and they didn't offer them to me. They said, hey Larry, is there any way you think we can get these over to the fire department? We wanna thank them for everything that we do. Um, so I was able to go ahead and deliver some pizzas to firefighters, which in case you guys didn't know, the one thing firefighters will never turn down is food. Um, and I will not be at the National Day of Prayer event, um, the, the ceremony. The Broward School Board has the Facilities Task Force, which I represent this area on, and as you guys can tell, I have a lot to say about some of those things. And with that, if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, please call me on my cell phone at 954-632-7544. Thank you. Commissioner Daly. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the only thing I'm gonna say, uh, based on Commissioner Vignolo's comments, uh, is, is heaven forbid a world where there are more Dan Daly's. <laughs> Um, I agree. <laughs> uh, but, but all in all, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the, the team political forum and the opportunity that it afforded me and so many other students. So um, I, I really hope that it continues uh, to inspire students in our city. Um, I did want to give a shout out uh, to staff. Uh, as many of you guys know, Unplugged is like my, one of my favorite events. I think it's unique. I think it's a good time for the community to get, come together. Um, and staff does an amazing job, particularly uh, Communications and Marketing, uh, Parks and Rec, and Public Works, who else am I forgetting? The PD, Fire, any, everybody um, come together to really make that um, a fantastic event. Uh, we had a really great weekend, and I think, um, I think the residents are starting to see that, right? They're starting to see more events in this downtown area. This, this, this concept of a downtown Coral Springs is becoming less and less foreign um, because they're starting to see things happen. Um, I have to tell you, at, at first, I was, I was a little concerned moving from the, the art walk to, to the, what are we calling it? The Grand? Grand Lawn. The Grand, the Lusa Maglia Grand Lawn. Um, 
But um, I, I have to tell you, it really worked. I think it was really neat, and to have people up close and personal to their to their building, right? Um, parking was a breeze. Uh, the event was wonderful, and I and I hope that we can continue to do that. And I hope that we've structured in, uh, based on this commission's direction from last year, some some additional programming. Um, I think it's really important to continue to get people used to coming to the area. Uh, so that when development continues to take shape, whether that's the financial plaza or across the street or wherever, um, people are familiar with, with the area. So I want to thank everybody for, for that. I did want to touch on Village Square again. Uh, Mr. Manager, if you've got any kind of update, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Village Square, for those that don't know, is the old Broward College Plaza. It's a, frankly, mess. Um, and, I, and I really hope that there is some movement there, and I hope that the city... Um, we'll do a code sweep, just like we do everywhere else, uh, to make sure that they are on par. If, if they're not going to uh, work with us uh, for the future of, of downtown Coral Springs, then um, you know I understand that we've been trying to work with them, and if they're not willing to do so, then you know they need to pick up their uh, put up or shut up. Manager, I do not have an update from our last meeting. We're still working with the property owners. Obviously, there's many property owners there. Sure. Um, we haven't uh, forgotten about that, the need to redevelop that property. So, but no update from our last meeting. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I do intend to continue to bring it up because I, I think it's vital. Um, I think we have waited long enough. Um, and I think a lot of it, at least for me, is now based on, on the greed of, of, of certain property owners. And while, um, you know, it's a free market and people can ask what they want for their property when you have a deal um, and a deal to be made and then someone comes in at the 11th hour and changes that deal um, at the detriment of our city uh, again and again and again, I think it's time that we ramp up the heat. So um, I'm gonna continue to raise that, that issue. Um, next, next issue I raised, and I know it's only been a week, but, um, but I think it's pressing and I, I wanna just keep it on everybody's radar is the recycling issue. Do we have a timeline on, on getting an update on that? We could have Rich Mashad come up during my comments and give an update on recycling. Awesome, great, uh, thank you. Uh, it seems so. So the the former the former location that was popular with eighteen wheelers was uh, Coral Ridge Drive next to the Seven Eleven, um, and they would park on that strip, and they would kind of hang out there, and they would park overnight, and they would sleep and whatever, which obviously is not allowed by code. Um, they had also started using some of the storage facilities along Sample. Their parking lots uh, started to see that, and now the newest location is next to the Taco Bell on uh, on Sample Road. That just a vacant plot. They literally just pull in and park there. Um, I know that you know PD has been very helpful. I saw an email this morning. Thank you. Uh, I guess we went out last night and made contact or attempted to make contact. Um, you know, I think it brings the, I think it brings down the city, uh, when you allow, and I, I'll give you an example. The 18 wheeler literally had a, a, a trailer load of crushed vehicles. So that's what's parked on sample road for 12, 15, 18 hours. Um, that's not exactly something that I want, one, our residents to see, but two, folks that are coming to Coral Springs. You know, I used, I used the example when I was first elected of, of, of a realtor who was showing a home to a, a young couple and they had shown a home in, in Weston and they got off the Sawgrass Expressway at Sample and they made it no more than a mile uh, down Sample Road before they turned to the realtor and said, hey, no offense, but take me back to Weston. Um, I, I'm, I'm, and, and I'm sure that Joy can attest to this, first impressions are everything, so I don't know that I want folks' first impression to be an 18-wheeler sitting in the middle of an empty parking lot. Uh, or a vacant field for that matter. So if we can continue to keep the pressure on that, that would be awesome. Um, I, let's see, I'll, I'll leave that one for later. If anybody ever needs to reach me, you can email me at ddaily at coralsprings.org, reach me on my cell phone at 954-778-3304 or on any of the social media outlets. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, the request of uh, Commissioner Vignola, I want to first congratulate you on fine teen political forum. And I'm not going to say anything more because sometimes less is better than more. And I'll turn it over to the manager. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to have Rich Mashad come up and give a quick update on recycling and then that will conclude my report. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. 
As you're well aware, there's a lot of history when it comes to solid waste and recycling in this county. Um, five years ago, City of Coral Springs piggybacked City Deerfield Beach contract for recycling, with the vendor being Sun Bergeron. Uh, I'll skip the present and go to the future. The future involves a county task force headed by County Mayor Beam Furrow to look at some potential property in the county as a future recycling processing facility. It's generally known as the Alpha 250 property located in Pompano Beach. I'll start with the present and go back about six months. Uh, six months ago, the city was looking at Deerfield Beach because they were going out for bid again. They received uh, a no bid when it came to the recycling. I don't want to say that bid was open probably in January. Afterwards, uh, staff met with uh, Angela on purchasing. Angela sent out a, a letter of interest to any uh, companies in the business we got, letters of interest from Waste Management and a company called Waste Connections. Thereafter, we put together a scope of services and went out for bid and had a pre-bid meeting. Both firms had some comments. We adjusted our scope, and that bid was open on April 4th with no bids. At the, at the bid opening, I asked uh, the representative waste management if we could have a, a discussion to see if we could enter in some sort of terms for a future contract. She replied affirmatively that we could. We had our first meeting with her uh, two weeks ago. And we have another meeting planned with uh, that, that group uh, next Wednesday. Um, there's basically two components to our recycling bid. There is a processing fee and a revenue share. Both items are very much different than they were five years ago. Uh, we have not had any kind of proposal from them yet. We have our own thoughts about the numbers we'd like to see, but we're still in a negotiation process to do that. There's also an initiative out there that some other cities may have considered, which was to take your single-term recyclables to Willibrator and have them burn as waste to energy. The state recognizes about a 55% recycling credit for burning your recyclables versus 100% credit if you took it to a processing facility. So we plan on bringing an agreement to the commission, probably likely at the second meeting in June, um, for your consideration. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Dillon. Thanks, Rich. Uh, quick question. So the the contract that we went through and, and signed on to four or five years ago um, with Sun Bergeron, right? What was the what was the what were the terms in terms of of uh, right ending or anything? What, what what were the what were the terms in the original contract? I notwithstanding the buyout and everything else, I'll get there in a second. But what do you remember? Terms were basically a fifty dollar per ton processing fee and a. 5545 processing share with the city getting 45% of the of the revenue at that time for how long it was a 5 year term with an option well Look at it, I don't the, remember. the options would have been viable had Sunbrows run remained a, a a viable entity uh, as you know sure. there's lawsuits back and forth we've all got tons of correspondence from lawyers on that so they were not considered to be a good option going forward no, 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 and I understand that. So my, my question is, once that buyout took place, and I, and I raise these questions because these are s certain specific things that I'd like us, and I mean your office, uh, if possible, John, to, to take a look at, is what was communicated to existing uh, contracting cities, uh, like us, uh, when the buyout took place. So I want to know what, I, I, I think it's worth finding out what kind of, if, if any assurances were made, if any uh, comments were made on behalf of the new buyer to whomever about the status of the existing contracts. Um, you know, look, I understand that the county, and, and look, it's, it's, and Rich, you know this better than anybody, uh, waste and recycling are going to be the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And I know that the county has this long term plan, and what are we going to do with this site, and are we going to do this? And, right. But there is no opportunity to open a new facility tomorrow, right? So that's a long-term plan. So I want to make sure that we're availing ourselves of all of the options under our existing arrangement, even though, you know, not, notwithstanding the buyout. Um, so if we can kind of take a look at that, and I'd really like to kind of press um, the new owner and say, hey, now wait a minute, you, you committed. I, I just want to see. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't make any commitments. Maybe they said, hey, we're coming in and buying these contracts, and your contract's not renewable whatever it is, right? But I just want to know that we've worked that all out because I think ultimately this is going to be a problem. And I think a lot of the eyes around the county are on, are on us, um, which I have confidence in, uh, absolute confidence in, in our staff and your staff um, to, to, to weigh everything out. But I, I do want to do some digging from our, from our city attorney's side, if that's all right with everybody up here. 
I never, never thought when I, when I got elected I'd learn as much as I know about recycling and garbage. Thank you. Oh, oh. Talking trash. Rich Michon. Waste management has represented to us that they own the current recycling facility. They've also told us that they plan to shut that down. Right. And, but they have given us a opportunity to contract with them, which would allow us to still uh, dump our recyclables somewhere in the north part of the county, and they would be hauled to rooters down in Pembroke Pines. And, and what will happen to those recyclables? The part that is recyclable will be recycled. There's, there's, a, there's a portion of our waste stream that is contaminated, and they do waste composition studies to document what that percentage is. Ours is about 17%. So out of the entire load, 17% will probably be taken to a landfill. The rest will be recycled. The question? <clears throat> Mr. Carter. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this. What I understood for recyclables, like let's say a plastic bottle, the cap is not recycled. Is that correct? Historically, that's, that's been the message to our residents is the cap's not recyclable, correct? So that gets pulled off the line and put into a, another container that would go to, will be a landfill. Yeah. Along with plastic bags, a lot of things get put in recycling that shouldn't be, and that ends up going to a landfill. Is, right. How difficult is it to recycle caps? You know, it all comes down to market value, and the markets are very low right now. That's really the problem in the industry. Commissioner Vignola. So, so when we go ahead and we throw our soda bottle with the plastic cap on it in the recycle bin, someone's got to sit there and take that off? It's a manual yeah. process. It's a big conveyor belt. Everything goes on a conveyor belt. There are um, men and women on that line that pick the bags, the diapers, you name it, that goes into that recycle bin. They pick all that, that non-recyclable stuff off the line and put it in another garbage dumpster, which ends up going to the landfill. If, from what I found out, if the caps are not, when the caps are separate and they go through the baler, they become missiles. I, ju I just, please unscrew the caps off the bottles before you throw them in your blue bin. Mr. Dale. So I, I, can attest, I can attest to what Rich said because I had the opportunity to tour the, the Reuters facility a couple, couple months back. Um, and, and I understand the contamination, that's fine. What, and, and the reason I raised this two or three weeks ago is I've heard all sorts of different stuff. The latest thing that I have heard is that there will not be any actual recycling taking place. We're just basically going to pay them to take it away. There's no revenue share. We're paying them to take it away and they're gonna either burn it or landfill it in its entirety. So my issue moving forward is I wanna make sure that we have what is actually going to take place out in the public, in writing, in some other form of commitment, whatever it is, as we move forward. Um, because I think that, I, I think ultimately that, you know, is probably much more appealing to a, to a company than having to eat the, the loss of, of actually recycling something. Especially since by your own admission right now, they're looking to close that facility in a couple of years. True. Right. In California, there's a city called Foster City and it is built on garbage. So maybe that's an idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, hearing nothing, Mr. Hearn. Nothing to report, ma'am. Okay, I want to congratulate the city manager on his haircut and the meeting adjourned. <laughs> it's actually a contentious point, Mr. Mayor. His barber disagrees. <laughs>